before we start the proceedings, we let me uh, welcome our uh, our uh, moderator for this panel discussion, Mr. Sylvan Merlin, Deputy Pres Resident Representative, UNDP Egypt, who will moderate the panel session. And uh, are you going to um, introduce the panelists, or do you want me to do so? Okay. Our expert group of panelists comprises of Dr. Dalia Abdelkader, Chief Sustainability Officer, Commercial International Bank. Mr. Andre Permana, Director of Business, Indonesia Infrastructure Guarantee Fund. Also, Mr. Sanjeev Gupta, Executive Director, Financial Services Africa Finance Corporation, and Mrs. Manel Hassan, Director of Group Sustainability at Suezi Electric. I now hand over to Mr. Sylvan Merlin, Deputy Resident Representative at UNDP Egypt, who will moderate this panel discussion. I don't know if I, yeah, thank you again. Okay, we'll, we'll have a very short panel, which will be a, a hard break to what happened before. So I'll start right into it with uh, Mrs. Manal Hassan, Director of Group Sustainability in El Swedi Electric uh, uh, Company. So Swedi Electric has complex multi-country uh, operations and manufacturing. Um, it comes with countries' exposure, and at the same time, um, Swedi has a strong commitment to sustainability. So you have purchased in the past uh, policies from uh, ISIC, uh, to facilitate your operation. You have also a long-standing relationship and I understand you just signed an MOU with uh, ISIC um, just today. Um, so my, my first question is how did you benefit from, from ISIC in general? And beyond that, what are your own climate uh, action target, particularly in reference to your low carbon commitments? Do you work towards um, how do you do to re originate projects that uh, go in that direction? And regarding ISIC new commitments toward climate action, how do you think you will be um, working together in the future, based on this MOU as well? Now? Yes, okay. Um, our relationship started back in 2005 and uh, it was our first deal and it was to really cover the risk in uh, uh, Sudan. And we were, uh, the first finance uh, that we did with the group was around uh, $60 million uh, and where we were able to uh, facilitate uh, doing transformers and substation and cables. And this was our first, um, okay, thank you. This was the first time that we did uh, a business with the bank. However, we were very impressed by the professionalism of the team and the paperwork and how they facilitated everything and uh, it was done very fast. So we moved on to the second transaction of growth and it was in Ethiopia and they were able to finance even a longer term uh, business deal with us uh, around, 60, around 125 million uh, euros and around 95 million dollars on uh, a large scale for seven years. Uh, the partnership um, uh, protects us in the security from the default of payment and as well from any risk that we are taking in the operation countries. Uh, today, this memorandum that we signed, we're very happy with because um, it's, it is actually uh, mandated with us to our climate change and decarbonization strategy and as well with the water risk. Now, how we actually uh, will work in this memorandum of understanding is that it will uh, support us in uh, the PPP uh, projects, it will support us in renewable energy investment, it will uh, support as well uh, in uh, doing business not only in Egypt but as well in member states. Uh, our uh, journey of decarbonization as our industry is really split between production, we have 28 production facilities across uh, the continents and we have uh, more than 300 uh, type of cables that we export uh, started by us uh, looking at the international uh, trends and I would advise that each industry should compare itself to the leaders so to us we looked at uh, models abroad in the US and in uh, Europe and we've seen the standards and their decarbonization map and from there we drafted a strategy companies should have 
the board uh, approving to do uh, the motion and the roadmap because if the board is committed, then it will facilitate everything. Uh, we're so looking forward uh, of the support of the bank in our next uh, phase, which uh, we will update our uh, sustainability strategy. We actually have it up until 2030, but online we stopped at 2023, since we're in 2022, so we will update it to 2025. So definitely, uh, we really, really appreciate this memorandum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam. Um, I'll, I'll turn now to uh, Mr. Sanjeev Gupta, Executive Director, Financial Services for the Africa Finance Corporation, based in Nigeria. Uh, IFC is an African uh, MFI focused on infrastructure solutions for African growth with a broad equity and uh, debt portfolio. So you are the risking and structuring infrastructure projects to make them bankable in Africa, including through the use of uh, insurance products the like uh, ISIC is producing. So my question is, do, do you use policies like the one uh, proposed by ISIC? And what does it do to you, uh, in, in particular with climate action projects, for example, in line with your, your recent white paper, which is called Roadmap to Africa COP, a pragmatic pack, path to net zero, which, which has been very much appreciated. And more broadly, what is the role of credit and political risk insurance in, in facilitating climate action in Africa, in your experience? Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Sylvain, for the question. Uh, I actually owe an apology to my fellow panelists and to the audience because I have to rush in five minutes because the meetings did get delayed and there's a couple of meetings that I can't say no to. But it made me chuckle a bit because here I am talking about insurance and risk mitigation. And having worked in Africa for the last 30 years, I thought that I should keep enough insurance today for a half an hour, one hour spillover, which I didn't. So I'm sorry about that because that's where I think insurance starts. But be as it may, uh, the bigger point that you asked is, as a multilateral institution, investing in infrastructure projects across what is now 34 countries for us, uh, how do we uh, mitigate risk and how do we use insurance? So, very quickly, I just want you to know this, that we in use insurance heavily, very heavily. Um, as a matter of fact, in the last few years, we probably done insurance covers of close to $2 billion on our project finance transactions. And why insurance is important for us is for three reasons. And I want the audience to appreciate it because of the continent that we are working in. First is obvious, it mitigates our own risk in terms of the exposures we have and creates a more uh, risk acceptable or tolerance acceptable limit for us to invest. The second and the most important thing when it comes to using insurance, which maybe a lot of people don't quite see, is that it allows us to distribute it that much more easily. It allows us to distribute it globally. As a matter of fact, a lot of our project finance exposures, we have managed to distribute to even fixed income managers in the US and insurance and life funds in Europe because they're looking for positive yields, right? And the third thing that it does for us and for Africa by default is it kind of brings capital to the continent because when we go and raise capital for our own institution to underwrite our business, we have difficulty, we have a challenge. But when we use insurance by default, by design, obviously it releases capital for us, which is why insurance for us is so important. One quick comment on the role of insurance going forward and the, and the role of multilaterals globally and private sector capital, if I may, because I'm going to excuse myself, is that obviously the climate agenda being what it is globally, notwithstanding, and I want to repeat this, that notwithstanding the opportunistic approach that the rest of the world is taking about climate secure, sorry, climate agenda vis-a-vis -vis energy security. There's an opportunistic thinking there, 
the continent of Africa is struggling because it is not attracting capital at all now for developing its fossil fuels. So on one hand, you have the excess liquidity in global systems, which is not coming in because of the climate agenda. And secondly, the risk perception. So what we are hoping is insurance products and the ability of private sector capital to then come in on the back of insurance will help the continent to attract capital in the renewable sector to start with and hopefully on a more selective basis in the fossil fuels sector which we still need. So I hope the rating agencies, the insurance sector, they cut us some slack on this particular aspect. Sorry, there's a lot of stuff that I kind of reeled off very quickly. I hope I made some sense. You will have to excuse me now. I'm sorry about this. Sanjeev, we, we promised it would be a short panel and, and an efficient one and you delivered and your experience of structuring these deals is very useful to us. Good luck with the minister. That's okay. It, it we'll keep it cozy. No, I want to turn to... Um, okay, I'm sorry. I do apologize for everybody, but I have a flight at three, so I have to leave. But uh, thank you so much. No, no, Andre, you can come closer to us. I'm going to make it cozy. It's, a, it's not a panel anymore. It's a fireside chat. Yes, it's a chat. So I want to turn now <clears throat> to Dr. Dalia uh, Abdelbaker. Chief Sustainability Officer, sorry, <coughs> with the Commercial International Bank, CIB, uh, in Egypt. CIB is uh, the leading private sector bank in Egypt, offering a full range of financial products, notably supporting um, uh, exporters, uh, sustainable finance, and most notably emitting green bonds for the first time in 2021, and the first one to do so in the region. As a, as a commercial issuance. So uh, with this commitment to sustainable finance, um, could you elaborate on, on, on climate finance, what it means for CIB, how you deal with risk, with uh, credit and political risk, and is de-risking something you are offering in one way or another to your clients? And uh, how would you benefit from what uh, ISIC is providing for the member countries of uh, the Islamic Development Bank? Well, thank you. Um, CIB actually brings to the table a different approach that I would like to share with you and uh, potentially share with the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, the way we see climate is uh, we do not do risk insurance, climate insurance. We do uh, risk management. So it's not insurance, it's risk management. And this is by virtue of the fact that we issued our green bond and along the way, we managed to integrate sustainability inside our systems and strategies. And we reached a point whereby we can see the business case of climate change. So it's not like we have to transfer risk. Insurance is about transferring risk. We manage risk. Managing risk is through two things, two approaches. Environmental social risk management system to mitigate the impact of our portfolio, of our lending portfolio on the environment. So we diligently screen the environmental and social impact of all our lending transactions on the environment. We have a specialized team for that. But it's not only our impact on the environment, it's the impact of climate change on our portfolio. And that's why we are we subscribe to the TCFD, and now we are managing climate risk, uh, conducting uh, scenario analysis and stress testing. So we manage risk. We do not export or load off risk. Right. The other thing, which is the other side of the coin, is we identify the business case of climate. Climate change uh, is a mega trend that offers you opportunities and threats. If you do not change your business model fundamentally, you're left with the risk, and the, the, the easiest thing is to seek insurance. Insurance is the last defense line. It's very important, but this is not the, the, the first step. The first step is to manage risk, identify the business case, because climate offers 
us and our clients business opportunities. Uh, funding SDGs creates investment needs of around five to seven trillion dollars annually, and that's growth. Uh, the fastest growing uh, businesses since 2019 are the sustainable investments in terms of amount, size, and profitability. Uh, that's why CIB in April 2021, we became founding signatory of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, and it was not mandated. It was a voluntary decision because we can see the business case of decarbonizing our portfolio. Uh, so in a nutshell, we manage risk, identify the business case, and if Islamic Development Bank and ISIC managed to see that w along the way we need support because this is what we do, but how we do it is uh, through bonding with our clients. And it's not the conventional funding, nor the conventional transfer of technical assistance, not just that. And it's not the de-risking in the financial sense. We usually think of de-risking as the cost of capital, sharing the cost of capital. Our experience with the IFC, who helped us develop the, uh, the $100 billion green bond, there was no concession, and it was not cheap. There was no preferential rates. However, the technical assistance, helping us with the infrastructure, helping our clients, not only technical assistance, moving to our clients, sitting with them, identifying the business cycle, and helping them find the business case for climate finance, like energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, green building. We offer them edge certification, and we create the ecosystem. Uh, a couple of days ago, we launched a sustaining sector program. It's a, it's a knowledge hub, a multi-stakeholder platform uh, to empower different sectors in Egypt to find the business case of climate uh, finance and to empower them to grow. So what we offer mainly is uh, sustainable finance products, funding, no preferential rates. One program has a kickback but we don't count on this because we don't want to position sustainable finance or climate products as something that has to be incentivized. If you understand it, it has a built-in business case. And impressively, when our clients see the business case, they found that the capital investment is um, that the operational savings and costs, energy efficiency and cost saving, uh, is much better than the initial capital uh, uh, cost. So in a nutshell, uh, insurance is the last defense line, and it should not preclude us from seeing the business case and the beauty of climate finance if we understand the business case. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. I, I like that. You're, you're bringing us a, a, a useful alternative uh, outlook on, on, on risk, a much more qualitative. Um, no, and I, I have another question. I'll come back in one minute. Now, I want to turn to Mr. Andre Permana, Director of Business at the Indonesia Infrastructure Guarantee Fund, or EIIGF, or also called PTPII, which is one of uh, Indonesia's uh, Minister's Finance Special Missions Vehicles, mandated to provide sovereign guarantees on political risk for PPP, uh, mostly infrastructure PPPs, and on uh, credit risk for uh, state-owned enterprises program. Now, uh, in May 2022, so that's uh, last month, you have uh, guaranteed a portfolio of around $30 billion with 40 projects. Um, so that, that's quite impressive. Um, now, you, your clients are in different sectors, both uh, green, uh, uh, traditional, but also green infrastructure with uh, uh, wind and solar. How do you balance both uh, uh, aspects of your portfolio? And what are your climate action goals? What, have you set climate action goals? What are they? And what opportunity do you see in, in uh, facilitating this part of your portfolio, which is a bit new? OK. Thank you, Zidane, for the question. And Dalia, nice meeting you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So answering to your uh, very interesting question and uh, just trying to enhance a bit and clarify that uh, uh, out of the 40 projects, oh, 
Okay. Out of those 40 projects, which uh, in total around 30 billion US dollar, it's an investment value. But in total guarantee exposure, we have around 5 billion uh, US dollar. So it it shows us there's a leveraging context when we can enable uh, some investment to our infrastructure projects uh, by providing uh, less than 130 of uh, uh, guaranteed exposure. So this is something that by providing five, bi five billion US dollar, the government has, uh, can create around uh, 30 billion uh, value of projects. So this is something that has been intended by the government by providing guarantees, sovereign guarantees to those projects, we can uh, enable some investment. And this is something that, uh, referring to your question, we, we have also to refer that our role is not only as become the financing enabler, because we know that credit enhancement products, it financing, uh, it's enabling financing, right? But somehow, when we work with the governments, we also uh, has a role as the project enabler and ecosystem enabler. So. In terms of the green uh, initiatives and uh, climate changing uh, climate changes issues, this is something that we actually deal with uh, in some of our projects. So, for instance, when we work in one of the toll road uh, that actually uh, located in a uh, coastal area, it also actually serve as uh, the risk mitigation for the lump subsidence. So it's it's. Uh, we, we, when we review the project, we actually have the appraisal criteria on the aspect of also the technical uh, viability, which relates to the economic and, and uh, economic aspects, and also the and environmental and social aspects. So this is something that why we see this sustainability issues is very very important in supporting the project that we are guaranteeing, and we have so many projects. Uh, uh, the one that I mentioned, the 40 projects, 30, 31 of them are PPPs. We have uh, some more in our pipelines now uh, in, in many different sectors, including some renewable energies and so on. We see also the, the trends on when you see how we see ourselves, uh, how to balance this. Uh, first of all, we, we see the demand for the financing first and we see the project itself, how it uh, addresses the sustainability issues. And with, when it becomes the, also the concern of the lenders or the potential lenders, then we see uh, by our guarantee assessment, which not only for the risk assessment, uh, we can relate on the political risk, but also on the uh, project viability assessment, it hopefully can create confidence to the potential lenders. And for those who are concerned on the climate changes issues, we actually expect to uh, convince them more. By now, we have mandated also by our shareholder, the Minister of Finance of Indonesia, to implement the ESG framework uh, for all the SMVs, the Special Mission Vehicles of uh, the Minister of Finance. We have five of them. We have uh, the Guarantee Fund. We also have uh, PTSMI as the financing infrastructure, infrastructure financing uh, firm, which can provide long-term financing. We have the Exim banks and also uh, <clears throat> those relates to the renewable energies. energies. So those S SMVs are now being mandated to implement the SG ESG framework in terms of how we can address the concern on the, on the green aspects. So this is something that we are heading to, Sylvain, and hopefully by uh, keeping our mandates relevant to the stakeholders' need and also to our capacity as a public sector enabler. This is something that we can uh, contribute more on the, on the development in Indonesia. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Andre. I, I'm, I'm, I actually like what you're both saying because it, it, it really uh, br brings a, a wider understanding of, of the interest. Now, I want to turn back to, to Dalia and maybe a little bit more short-term question on what do you think is needed as a, <clears throat> as a way forward to advance climate finance, uh, whether adaptation and mitigation, especially since, uh, you know, here in a few months, we'll be gathering again for COP27. Uh, what are CIBAE plans in this, in this uh, domain? And, uh, and I'm curious, 
Um, is CIB uh, looking at what's happening with the Ministry of Finance, with the Financial Regulatory Authority in Egypt? Is um, CIB any um, where uh, towards looking into Sukuk and Green Sukuk as a commercial uh, or as a private issuer? Well, it's a compounded question. But anyway, uh, the way forward for CIB, we have a very clear uh, system building and uh, sustainable finance strategy track. Uh, after the green bond, we are heading to expand our portfolio of sustainability linked loans, expand the sustaining sector program because we are targeting system transformation in Egypt. No matter how uh, structured, how advanced we become with sustainable finance, it takes two. So I always say, unless our sectors, the whole ecosystem, and by ecosystem, I mean government, regulators, uh, technology, MDBs, we should all get on the table because, I mean, there are always small gaps that derail. Even if you give uh, a perfect financial uh, uh, terms for a client, sometimes he lacks the knowledge, the technical assistance, and we sh as I mentioned, we, we saw it very closely, but that you become an eye opener. And this is a new role for banks. So CIB is continuing with this. Whether, I mean, after listening to um, yesterday about uh, WAF linked products to cook, uh, honestly, I was not aware of, uh, of this power. And I think this is very much, I mean, I'll take it back to the senior measures and see how, but we are very much, uh, um, very much determined to proceed with sustainable finance product development, whether on the debt or the equity side, and the system transformation in Egypt, and it's working um, quite good. I mean, you can see that you are gaining territory and you can see the system transformation, and it's very assuring. That's why I always tend, I stress, that climate is about opportunities. Climate is a game changer. The system, our nature is telling us it's no longer business as usual. So we have to revamp our business model, our risk frameworks, our lending criteria, our E and S and G are part of the formula. And, and this is established by now. I mean, two years down the road with the, uh, with the pandemic, which is a social dimension uh, triggering the worst uh, economic crisis since Second World War. This is not a credit risk. So, I mean, we learned the lesson. Financial institutions learned the lessons. It's the ESG. We are progressing with that. Um, on, a, on a general level, ahead of COP, I think COP is either a high gain or a high pain thing. I mean, it's either an opportunity or it will be a lost opportunity for a region like Africa. For Africa, climate is existential. It is survival. It's not development. It's not economic growth. It is existential. We're talking about starvation and drought. And we are five months, I mean, we only have five months. And the way forward, which I think Islamic Development Bank might be part of this proposition or solution, is to um, establish uh, African sustainable finance governance mechanism. Over the last couple of days, we've been listening to panels. And you find inspiring stories, inspiring products, uh, business solutions. You just connect them and we're there. Uh, let me emphasize that we have to be determined from now on over five months to get together, maybe under uh, the leadership of uh, Islamic Development Bank with the Ministry of Planning, Economic Development, African Development, the Central Bank, to target, uh, to prepare the road ahead for COP27. Now, it's very, well established that it is finance. It's not political negotiations. We will never get there if we depend on political negotiations. And you want to make sure that COP27 is not another COP. It's not this uh, incremental progress or pledges or initiatives or broken promises. Two things happened in COP26, which we label as uh, the, the, the COP of unmet expectations. However, two very significant things took place. The GFANS, which includes 450 institutions that pledged $130 trillion in assets to be allocated to sustainable investments, and 
the International Sustainability Standard Board, which uh, counts for non-financial reporting. So it becomes like mandatory for investors to allocate their money to uh, investors. So to make a long story short, we have now the supply side. This is the derivative of COP27. It's our accountability to work on the demand side. We have to prepare bankable projects, uh, adaptation projects in agriculture, water, energy, building, and infrastructure. And we have to have this, I mean, the supply is there, the money is there. And mind you, it's not only the GFAN's money, it is our money, because MENA is a net exporter of capital. We have money here, so funding is there in plenty, in plenty. It's our role to get together to do the following three things. Establish a uh, sustainable finance African taxonomy, because we have to standardize the literature. Uh, innovate in sustainable finance products, like yesterday, the Sukuk, the WAF. I mean, there are plenty, the FinTech. I mean, it's, it's very impressive. Uh, the third thing is um, a pipeline of bankable projects so that we invite global investors. So this is what I expect from Isaac, is to expand the role beyond insurance. From here to insurance, there are lots of lost opportunities. You have five months, Dalia. Five minutes? Yeah, five months. They're over. <laughs> I'm done. No, um, b before uh, wrapping up, I, I, I want to, to return to, to you, Andre. Um, one of the rationales for I IGF uh, establishment a little bit more than 10 years ago was to ring fence the Indonesian budget, state budget, uh, to uh, manage the, the contingent liability of the government and this large infrastructure project, um, particularly for, for with government. Now, um, the, we, we've, in doing that, you are exposed. And just like uh, I seek, you, are, you have a mission to limit this exposure. Now, uh, so you are a fellow organization of ISIC. Uh, how do you see it? So you, you, are, you are the national level, they are the uh, level of the uh, Islamic uh, bank uh, members. How do you see the cooperation between ISIC and, and, and you no, noting this difference of, uh, of level difference, maybe also in the credit uh, rating, etc. Okay, thank you, Sylvain. Uh, on this very particular interesting question, yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to highlight and brief, brief, uh, give brief overview to the audience that uh, the IGF model or guarantee model is a bit different than other uh, sovereign guarantee model, which is provided uh, directly by the Minister of Finance. In IIGF case, IIGF as a state-owned enterprise is set up to provide the sovereign guarantee so that there's a function of uh, you mentioned the ring fencing when there's certain claim can come from uh, our guarantee it's not directly hit to the state budget so there's something that uh, uh, refers to the ring fencing function uh, interestingly with this uh, business model or guarantee model it somehow uh, creates certain uh, efficiency and uh, more credibility in terms of how the project is being prepared to get the, the structure bankable and as you mentioned earlier it is something that you're also working on on your projects uh, this is very important because typically uh, when the guarantee is not really assessed properly and provided uh, in a uh, prudential manner uh, this is something that even can create more contingent liability to the government and in the case of uh, us in IGF, uh, we see this uh, ring fencing uh, <coughs> function is also somehow can create doubts to, to the private investors because they, they can see that this is not uh, sovereign or something. But this is something that uh, our government has been uh, very clear in the regulation and the framework. So that somehow it can uh, resulting to the, the portfolio of projects that I mentioned earlier, and it's it's keep coming to in our pipelines. And uh, as you mentioned, we we can also see Indonesia as one of the uh, quite active uh, country in 
developing this uh, infrastructure pipeline thanks to our government was very committed in uh, uh, this initiative so in terms of being also the member of idb we have uh, actually initiated some discussion with the idb groups uh, initially with the isec uh, we can we started even as early as 2012 and we renew our MOU in 2016, uh, 2018, yeah, bro, yes, sir. And this is something that we want to uh, see as the member of the IDB and also potential partner of the ISEC because we also have a similar discussion with MIGA of the World Bank, how we can structure our uh, credit enhan enhancement products to uh, create a structure that such a way address certain uh, different uh, uh, fundamental issues in the project not only let's say in terms of the political risk coverage that can be provided by ISEC but somehow we can also see some more fundamental issues on the project uh, feasibility on the project preparation that's not doing uh, that's not done properly this is something that we hopefully can provide a very good pipeline so that it can fly when we go to the transaction and in terms of risk we can also be enhanced by the uh, uh, existence of the PRI so which hoping that this there's, there's a more uh, good pipelines in our infrastructure pipe projects and talking about the IDB groups we also working on the other member of IDB not only those providing the financing to our projects but also in terms of can do the capacity building to the uh, member countries including Indonesian uh, counterparts so this is something that we are already working on under the MOU. So as uh, a summary, I can uh, say to you that the existence of the cooperation between ourselves as a guarantee fund of the government with the uh, multilateral development bank like uh, IDB and ISEC as a member is very important, especially uh, we see the similarity being the development agencies uh, so this is something that we hope can be seen also by the potential private uh, investors or lenders to be more uh, attracted to the initiative and uh, more actively participated in our projects. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Well, I'm, I'm glad we, we stuck around uh, after the, the last panel to, to listen to our colleagues because uh, I, I'm really getting a lot uh, maybe even too much, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be wrapping up um, while being fair to the present and the absent. So uh, I think what we heard is uh, Manal explaining all the, the good value there is uh, in their partnership, Swede Electric partnership with i6, so from a, a medium to large uh, company in Egypt, working in the, in the region and in Islamic countries uh, to partner with uh, uh, the guarantee arm of the Islamic Development Bank. Then we heard from Sanjeev that uh, their risking is actually doing a lot of things that goes beyond risk, including, uh, as he mentioned, bringing more capital to Africa. Uh, um, then we heard from um, uh, Dalia um, bringing a very interesting perspective on what is the risking, uh, first of all, uh, working closely with your clients, not only from the financial side, but also uh, very, very closely with the rest. We're very keen on all your nice plans on sustainable finance. And I, I have to note what you're saying, is that when you deal with mega trends, and there's a, a few mega trends I can think of we are dealing with at the moment, then we have to deal with uh, probably new systems, system transformation, and not uh, maybe doing reinsurance or um, de-risking at the margin, maybe reinventing things. So this is very interesting. And from you, uh, Andre, I, I, I hear something very interesting is that guarantee is not taking much risk. Actually, you are not. You have very strict guidelines. And even based on that, you manage to do a lot of de-risking uh, for, for your project. And I really like the example you mentioned uh, of these projects that are um, 
because they are exposed uh, or because they are doing good things in the coastal areas, well, they're also uh, doing their part vis-à-vis uh, -vis climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. So um, I was not expecting we would, we would go uh, that far from a, a very terse uh, and, and a bit um, um, strict topic of a, a de-risking, but I'm very glad. And I'm glad you two stayed, uh, and we will tell the other two what they missed. So, based on that, uh, Rehan, uh, I want to turn to you maybe to close, and I think we have one video on ISIC activities that should be playing now. So, thank you all for your uh, patience, and uh, hope you benefited from this. I'm just... At ISIC, our goal has always been to support sustainable economic development in our member states by providing risk mitigation and credit enhancement solutions. And right now, one of the biggest risks facing governments, businesses and the world is climate change. That's why we facilitate financing, trade flows and investment for climate action and provide solutions that serve our Member States' Paris Agreement obligations and the private sector ESG agenda. We support the development of renewable energy projects, improve climate governance around the world, and drive the global transition to a green economy. Hi, my name is Kurt Martin Larsen. I'm a Managing Director at IKEA in the Wind Group. In 2016, EGF and ISEC entered into a reinsurance agreement about four wind farms in Turkey. For EGF, this cooperation with approximately 40% reinsurance of our exposure was crucial to complete the transaction. EGF was very pleased to work with ISEC on this transaction, benefiting from your experience and capacity in the region. We appreciate the cooperation with institutions like ISEC uh, to fight climate change all over the world and especially in the ISIC member states. We have helped to facilitate the development of four wind farm projects in Turkey with the capacity to generate 360 megawatts of electricity. A waste energy project in the UAE with an estimated net reduction of 460,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year as well as a reduction of waste sent to landfills. Four 50 megawatt solar power plants in Egypt, one of the largest solar projects in the world, and a sanitation and sewage infrastructure project that would give 1.2 million people in four Egyptian governorates a sustainable source of clean water. ISEEC promotes and enables real, tangible climate action all over the world, with long term life changing benefits for local communities, many of whom face the worst impacts of climate change. We work closely with industry-leading partners including clean energy companies Mazen and Mazda and sustainable electric and infrastructure company Elsweedy Electric to create innovative and adaptable solutions that help shape a resilient future for the planet, for all of us and for generations to come. At ISEC, we are always looking to the future. By making climate action a priority, we are working with our member countries and investors to avoid economic risk. And in doing so, we are also helping to protect countries and communities against climate-related risks by providing energy security, clean water and more resilient infrastructure. Together with our partners, we are paving the way for a sustainable path for our member countries. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to uh, ask um, Mr. Silvan and our speakers to stay for a few moments where Mr. Yasser Alapi, the Senior Manager of Business Development Department for ISEC, will be presenting tokens of appreciation.
Thank you to our speakers and to Mr. Silva and Mr. Yasser Alafi. Thank you. Please, uh, I would like you all to know that our next session will be starting at 2 p.m. sharp, uh, and it's titled Beyond Recovery, the Resilience and Sustainability of the Emerging Fintech Solutions. We look forward to this coming session. It will start at 2 p.m. sharp, so I hope you will all be here seated and waiting for the beginning of this session. Thank you.